Are you guys ready up there? Alright. Alright, quiet on the set. Welcome to another episode of Adventures in Movies. My name is Nathaniel Muir, and I'm the movie editor at AIPT. Joining me on these ongoing ventures is the guy who supposedly has 99 problems, but being sick ain't one. Is that me? <laughs> I'm Danny. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> uh, that's what I, I just hear rumors. Like, I heard a rumor about the other person who's uh, joining us on these adventures. Uh, apparently, there's some videos on the internet where um, he goes by Old Dirt McGirth. <laughs> It's backwards, Larry, to you. My name's Blake. Hello. How are you guys doing? The, the state's uh, reopened. Not to uh, me. You could get a haircut. That's still not open. Well, yeah, not to me either. You know, I was this weekend we were out and about. We were, like, doing some shopping. Um, the there's So restaurants are open. The Rudy's parking lot was packed. I don't even really? want to think about how many people were in there. The Rudy's? Like, the barbecue place? But, I guess... You would think you... there'd be better barbecue places. For you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, it's because all the other, like the other ones, they were there was lines outside, but they have oh, bigger oh. lots. So, right. Uh, oh, the, I see. I see. It's, yeah, like they were obviously practicing the social distancing, but uh, and I don't know, Rudy's they have those big long tables and stuff, so maybe, and it's a small parking lot, so maybe it wasn't as bad as it looked. But from the outside, it looked horrible. Speaking of social distancing and stuff, so um. This goes to uh, so Austin, about an hour away from here. But uh, I've always thought like most Austinites are up their own asses. Uh, did you guys hear? <laughs> I'm serious, man. Their whole like keep Austin weird thing, which they stole from Portland. Um, their forward thinking thing, even though they constantly have like you know a GOP member in office and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fucking take that, you... Austin. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Fuck them. Did you hear that they threw that guy in the in the lake just because he told them to like not not be hugging each other and smoking and drinking? What? what they threw him in the lake? Yeah, there was, so a bunch of people like over Lake the Austin? weekend were like Lake Travis. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of people were uh, a ladybird lake or whatever. A oh bunch of people God. were like hanging out and drinking and smoking and doing you know whatever those patchouli smelling motherfuckers do. <laughs> and um, a park ranger came by and told them like, hey, you know, you guys are gonna have to like have some distance between each other. And some people, to their credit, were like, yeah, we're sorry, it's cool. Some dude just straight up pushed him in the lake. Oh, that's so fucked what? up. I hope he was able to arrest him. I mean, that's like a law enforcement officer. Yeah, it's actually uh, it's a serious crime because it's an assault on, a, like you said, on, a, on, a law, on an officer. He regrets it, which, you know. But, I bet. <laughs> you know, I, 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 uh, I saw the news article and I was like, huh, I don't really believe that. But then there's actually footage of it. But um, oh, oh. I bet uh, they're drinking I'm Bud sure. Light Seltzer. But I guarantee it. <laughs> They were drinking their white claws. I, I'm sure. Oh, exactly. Um, Same shit. <laughs> <laughs> Truly I'm sure, though, the, and I was thinking, like, I'm sure they were like, oh, it's because, you know, the government's holding us down. It's like social distancing has nothing to do with what what uh, party you support. I mean, it's just smart. But, yeah, that's that's my rant about Austin, which I hate. And I lived there for a few years, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> not count, you not counting there, anybody. Right? Uh, Everyone who everyone who lives there sucks, except for anyone who's listening to the show. Like you're cool. Sorry, <laughs> that's pretty cool. I mean, I, <laughs> I like Austin. I, like, I like my time. It's a really good brewery there called Just the King. Austin's cool. The people <laughs> suck. Um, so news, like I, I didn't think there was any news, but uh, Danny reminded us that, uh, in fact, there was some really big Star Wars news. Um, if if you're a fan, uh, Taika Waititi will be directing the next feature length film in the star wars franchise now I, I saw that he was directing it but i didn't see any dates or anything like that did they announce anything about it no i didn't see anything any dates it's just he's going to be directing the next film that will be released in cinema so that could be in the next two years five years depending when this is completely over and everybody could go back to normal i guess uh but yeah i don't think anything has been re announced really he just his name was announced, and then the same thing with her name. And I'm thinking, I can't, I'm going to pronounce this name, Christy <laughs> Wilson Karens. I don't know Karens. I guess that's yeah, how you I pronounce mean, her last. You could have done way worse, I think. <laughs> yeah, she. Well, I'm so, yeah, she also wrote 1917. So he writing the movie with her. 
So he's directing and writing or half writing the next Star Wars movie, which is I think is exciting. When I saw that, I was yeah, like, hey, he's... that's awesome. Uh, you know what I hope it is? Just to piss everybody off, a fucking reboot. Let's reboot it! A new hope! <laughs> With more Skywalker. We briefly mentioned the Sky Wars, uh, Skywalker saga coming to Disney+. Plus. So I know someone who's never watched them before, but they're starting from the beginning watching them all. Uh, they are on Return of the Jedi now. Uh, thought A New Hope was... Because they actually think the fans suck. It's one of those, like, you know, the, the vocal minority have ruined it for them. So yeah. uh, they watched the first... They watched A New Hope, thought it was really, really cool and cute, and didn't understand why fans liked it like the kind of fans that she's thinking about <laughs> so she didn't quite understand it uh and she thought empire was uh pretty cool that's how she put it so yeah uh, i guess we'll see. yeah but um she did know the uh the toy i i want to know how someone feels about the darth vader thing who doesn't know about it going in but oh, yeah. that was my only question so, about it um that he's actually they, eisenberg yep <laughs> yep he's the one making the mess <laughs> so they just start with episode I guess uh, they started with New Hope, and they're working original Quite prequel. Much, oh, okay, okay. Oh, that's not bad. I had my girlfriend sh- start from prequels to... Ah, well, I don't know why you did that to her. Why'd you do that to her? Actually, you know what's so funny? She really loves the prequels now, and we started watching oh, the God. Clone Wars. See, that's what I mean. That's why That's <laughs> why you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> she I, really I, I, uh, I, I watched it the same order as everybody did. Like the, the came out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I did too. I did too. But I, I start, I start like I guess cor- story chronologically being told, uh, and I complain through the whole way through. Oh, then I stop complaining for what like a, what an enjoyable experience. I know, right? <laughs> no, but uh, you know, I've been because I'm rewatching Clone Wars. Man, that shit is fucking awesome, man. There's like so much action, and they kind of like redeem Jar Jar Binks, but they really don't. Uh, yeah. It's just great. It's it's a great fucking show, and I don't know <laughs> if I've talked about it so much, but man, if you guys haven't really seen it, man, it's really fucking just. And there you have it, guys. Taiko Taiko Watiti directing <laughs> new Star Wars movie, <laughs> and uh, we do have a Star Wars podcast. Just as a reminder, so check it out <laughs> if, you, if you are interested in any of that That's stuff. True. We, if you are interested in any of that stuff that we discussed, check out Talking Tauntauns. So. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this movie. Scoob! Is that, that's uh, coming out? <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, that's really, really good. <laughs> so when, when does this come out? June June the 15th, you said? I, it was supposed to come out for the June, like, in, in theaters yeah. in June. But with all of this happening, you can now own it May 15th. Well, they're doing I will the not same be thing. doing that. What, <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's a Scooby-Doo retelling, I guess. It's an animated well, right, Scooby-Doo movie. Like, Oh, it's an animated movie. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it looks like they're encountering their first, I guess, mystery. But this is the the movie is taking the same route that Trolls World Tour did. You're they're going to be releasing it for you to own and rent for I guess the week after Mother's Day. Um, and they're I guess Warner Brothers is also trying to make some money because now they there's so much promotion for it. I've I don't know how many times on Twitter I saw like two ads come up like behind another ad. So I think Uh-oh. it's I think this is really smart move. And I think this is what we we're talking about last time too. Like with with everything that's happening, it's I think it's a great idea to start releasing like I guess kids movies because these kids are not going anywhere. Summer <laughs> summer started for them like True. two that's months ago. So why not start releasing these animated like shows or movies? Like on video already, like they're still gonna make a fuckload of money. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how much it costs. I guess my question about I, I remember a, I didn't think about the promotional side of it, but I have seen that like huge stand up like poster thing for it seems like two or three years. I've seen it at different movie theaters. I was wondering why they would release it in theaters and then just not make it like like they have all kinds of Scooby Doo movies that go to um what a, the Cartoon Network and stuff like that. I was kind of surprised yeah. that they were releasing it movies. But, I mean, that's cool. I mean, if there's a market for it. But uh, kind of into what we were talking about last week um, and now with this coming out, it looks like, if <laughs> you didn't catch on already, it looks the days of that, what was it, like 70-day theatrical exclusivity, that's pretty much gone. Um, mm-hmm. I just wonder when we're on the other side of this. Because I don't think it's good for distributors and definitely not for the theaters to – totally eliminate that exclusivity so i wonder how short it's going to be and what movies they're going to like i agree with you i think these um 
children's movies that probably weren't going to do so well in theaters. It's not a bad idea to do them on the same day. With Trolls, I was reading that that movie, despite the um, the uh, big time claims from NBC Universal, it's not going to do so well financially because they have a pretty big name cast. And now that right. cast, because they get bonuses depending on box office performances, they're demanding some sort of equivalent payout. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how they negotiate these sorts of things because a lot of things is tied into box office gross. So right. I guess we'll right. See. I mean. It- Everything comes down down to the you know the mighty dollar at the end of it, but yeah. I feel like if it if it does well enough, like we have like these two experimental films, because Trolls was going to be coming out right after uh, this last uh, James Bond movie, and it's sandwiched in between uh, Black Widow two, so it could it could survive you know and but I think Scooby Doo was being like squished between like everything that was coming in like so you have you know Black Widow you're gonna have. I don't even know what other movies were going to be coming out like from May to June. And that could just get washed away. If it comes out digitally, I think it it it's, it could survive, especially if you could buy yeah. it. That's where I think Universal didn't go well. Like you get faster money if you get to buy it because that's unlimited viewings. And that's, you know, less 20 bucks that you're not you're going to definitely get used really well. I'm consistently surprised by the number of people that buy stuff digitally, like to have like through services. I I don't do it personally, but I, I'm uh, I'm more aware that people do that a lot more than I realized. I guess. I, I think For the sure. ultimate, yeah. I think I, I think that's kind of what the no matter how much money Trolls doesn't or does make for the studio, I think ultimately the value in it will be how many people it introduced to the idea of purchasing movies online. I, I think it's going to um, – the ease of doing it. So I'm sure there was a lot of people who were mm-hmm. kind of standoffish about it. I think that will be the true value of that movie. And mm-hmm. I think that's what it will be most remembered for like you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, so this week we have a, a, an, an interview. Danny, you mentioned Mother's Day. So if you are listening to this, if you're a subscriber, you're listening to it on Friday or listening to this on a Saturday when it came out, uh, Mother Day, Mother's Day is about to come up. And uh, Shudder has a Mother's Day surprise. They're dropping a movie called – Z, um, the letter Z. Z is a horror movie on Shutter. Surprise, surprise. It's it's a it's a creepy kid movie. Uh, this one's a little different. It's a kid with an imaginary friend. Um, unsurprisingly, the imaginary friend wants to do more than just hang out and play games. But um, it delves in some pretty interesting themes: uh, mental health, uh, friendship, love, loyalty, that kind of stuff. And it has some really cool horror tropes and it's a very enjoyable movie and i definitely suggest it um we spoke with the director brandon christensen about mama trauma tropes and horror and uh, genuine scares and here's what he had to say how would you describe z um i would describe z as a a creepy kid movie that isn't actually a creepy kid movie after all it's more of a creepy mom movie because it kind of takes the uh, the uh, the idea of it being about a creepy kid and slowly uh, making you realize that it's actually um, not the kid that's creepy. It's it's the mom and her and, and her past and, and all those things coming coming back uh, to kind of to, to kind of get her because she's forgotten about everything and her her apathy as a parent. Hey, and um, what was your inspiration behind the story? Um, this film kind of came from the idea of when, when, when I was coming up with it, my, my wife and I were actually talking about some things that we were going through at the time. Like my oldest son at the time was, uh, just fresh into kindergarten and there's, um, I don't know if you, you have kids, but the first day of kindergarten is kind of interesting because for the first time you're sort of letting, letting go of your kid to sort of an, an entire Monday through Friday schedule, kind of five hours a day and, they're they're leaving you and they're leaving you know they're, they're basically everything that you you've been teaching them kind of goes with them and as they come home they start bringing home new ideas and new new drawings and you know new facts and stuff that they can't wait to tell you so we were kind of just dealing with uh, the loneliness of the house as as they they're gone for half the day and then the kind of surprises that they bring home with them every day as well. And, and my wife and I were talking about, well, what, what kind of ideas are there that could potentially be used? Um, and she threw out the idea of an imaginary friend. And so we started to really discuss, you know, how that might work where if a kid can see something, if a kid can talk to something, but the parents can't, um, that disconnect between the parent and child 
that, uh, you know, it's not just only frustrating as a parent, but it's also kind of scary when the things that are happening around the house um, start to feel almost supernatural. So that was the beginning, and, it, you know, as, as stories do, they just sort of evolve. The hardest part uh, was just to try and figure out, one, what he would look like if you ever saw him, and two, how much would you see him, like how much of these this, um, this force in, of nature in the house um, are you actually interacting with? Because, you know, when you're dealing with the imagination, it's such a, it's kind of a vague concept because it's imaginary. Right, and uh, that actually leads into my next question. Um, Z has a very, um, very neat and interesting look. Um, what inspired the look of Z? Um, the hardest part is kind of what, usually when you're doing a monster movie, uh, you're trying to make something that's scary. Like you want to do something that's kind of uh, has you know gross skin, crazy eyes, things that just right when you look at it, you identify it as scary. But the interesting thing about Z is that. It's not only that, like it needs to have this playful, um, almost childlike look to it because at the end of the day, it's trying to attract and lure this eight-year-old boy so that it will be friends with him. And if it's friends with him, then that might allow it to um, use the boy to get to his mother, which is its its actual goal. So um, when designing him, it was a lot of conversations about like, well, what, what kind of things make something scary and what kind of things make... uh, you know, would make a, a kid want to play with it. And it, we, the discussions always went to, you know, a giant smile because, you know, to a kid, a giant smile goes, oh, that's friendly. But to an adult looking at it, you'd be like, oh, my God, that's terrifying. You know, <laughs> I mean, those giant smiles are, are there, you know, when you think about a smile, it's supposed to be a happy thing. But when you over-exaggerate it, it takes on kind of a horrific uh, quality to it. So it's similar to, you know, clowns and Pennywise. Like a kid can look at Pennywise and be like, oh, that's cute, it's a clown, it's bright colors, it's smiling, it's got balloons, that's fun. But a parent, they're applying their own lens to it, and they're going, that's terrifying, <laughs> because it's wrong. it just feels wrong, you know? Yeah. And so that was kind of the main the main force of uh, the construction of what Z would look like. And, um, you know, in the independent space, you're very limited with your resources. So um, while we had discussions about trying to... Um, build him up and give him almost like a theatrical quality like the Babadook where you can see a silhouette, you know that hat, the brim of the hat, and you know exactly you know what it is and it's so scary. Um, we were kind of limited by just what we had. You know, we can't, we can't be like, here, concept artists, make me 30 designs of Z so I can choose from one because, you know, I, inevitably I'm the concept artist. So uh, it's a lot of just looking and trying to find inspiration somewhere and Eventually, you kind of just take what's available to you, and we found this great actor, um, Luke Moore, who's very tall, very slender, and uh, has a lot of interesting abilities with his body because he does a lot of contortion type stuff. And so we, we started to talk to him, and we built around his look and, uh, uh, you know, just utilizing what we had, which was a very... Um, you know, a tall and slender man that we could, you know, we could play with. So we, we took the design that we had, and we had a prosthetic on his face, and uh, we just manipulated it in, in post-production because uh, we needed to, um, you know, make his eyes bigger and more, you know, innocent and just sort of play up the features that he had that didn't quite translate as childlike. Cool, cool. Um, and um, now Z, the movie Z, um, there's some horror movie tropes in there, but uh, it also deals with some really heady themes like mental illness. Um, What do you want viewers to take away from it? Um, I kind of want them to use their own experiences to sort of help elevate the horror. I think uh, a good example is my cousins, when they saw the first kind of, uh, you know, early cuts of the film, certain things didn't really land with them as much because they weren't parents yet. But then since that happened, they've had their first kid. And, you know, things like toys going off, uh, it just seems like a uh, a creepy trope thing. But when you're actually living and you've got kids' toys in your house and they start going off randomly in the middle of the night, it takes on a kind of a new meaning because it's able to kind of, you know, it has that basis in reality that, uh, you know, that makes it more affecting for you. So I think, um, you know, I think parents will be able to watch this and get a different experience than someone that's, you know, a big horror fan and they want to see uh, some of those tropier aspects and the jump scares and, and, and things like that. But I like the idea of keeping certain plot elements like the past uh, with Beth and her father, keeping them more vague because uh, it it allows the viewer to kind of put their own spin on it. Like we, we give, we give information. We know that the parents, uh, 
something happened in, in Beth's past that caused you know a rift in their family. She's not close with her mother anymore. Her and her sister are distanced, and it's not until her mother dies that it kind of brings you know the family back together, which leads to Beth sort of discovering things that she'd forgotten about. But, um, you know, I, without being too explicit about what actually happened with her father, it allows the viewer to kind of um, create a little bit of their own narrative so they can, you know, potentially take their own experiences, like maybe a bad relationship, maybe uh, someone, you know, dealing with some sort of illness or something like that, and they can kind of apply it. And I feel like when you're able to do that, it gives it, gives it a bit more of a deeper meaning Um, Like, we don't ever outright say anything about mental illness. And me personally, I wouldn't say that it is about mental illness, but I totally understand why someone might think that. And um, was it difficult to balance the more visceral horror with the psychological horror? Um, I think they kind of work with each other well. Because if you've got got the visceral stuff, and you're taking taking basically a very... um, suburban family where you know the problems for most suburban families are very similar it's like taxes family issues school all these things they're kind of banal on the on the surface but then when you start adding these supernatural elements it starts to you know everything kind of from the outside seems so perfect it's almost like an american beauty thing where from the outside these families all seem perfect but the the moment that there's this one little stressor this one little um, straw kind of thing that breaks the camel's back and, and everything kind of implodes in on itself. It's like almost a house of cards. So it's, um, it's, I feel like they go hand in hand really well together because as you start adding in the supernatural elements, it starts to make you as a character and you as an audience kind of question the reality of what you're seeing. Like, you know, just like Beth is, she sees certain things happening. She's feeling certain things happening. And there is kind of like a tinge of familiarity with it because of what she experienced as a child. But, um, you know, it, you don't want to fully just launch off and start believing what an eight-year-old kid is telling you because, you know, on the surface, that's absurd. So it's it's kind of the, um, it's just how much are you going to believe and how much do you need to be proven right, or, you know, wrong about your beliefs before you start to accept that something, you know, might actually be happening. So I think... I think um, those visceral moments, like, say, the banister, it, it, it does make you question as a character the reality that you think you're living because, you know, certainly my son couldn't do something like that, you know? It's got to be something else. Right, absolutely. Um, and uh, going to that, um, Z, Z is very scary, and at times it does get violent, but uh, there's very little gore in it. Was this a conscious decision, or was it just kind of a product of making the movie? It's kind of a product of just making the film. I, I think that um, there's kind of a less, of, less is more situation here where, um, you, you know, similar to Stillborn, Stillborn didn't have, it had like the, the, the baby's crib, that was really the only blood in the film. Um, there's just something to keep, I feel like keeping those, there's, it's almost more shocking not to see certain things. Like, the, like for the banister example, we could have had the kid land on screen and, you know, you see his body or something. You're looking down at these broken bones and you've got this horrific image, like the beginning of it follows with the, the girl that sort of bent like a pretzel. And, and that's terrifying, but I like the idea of just sort of, watching the reaction to something because to me sometimes not seeing is scarier and and i kind of just take that from my own childhood like when i would watch um horror films with my family my mom would always kind of grab me and hold me during a scary part of something like uh, you know stanley kubrick's the shining where the the old woman in the, the the bathtub's about to get out and it's terrifying but to my mom she thinks it's better if she covers my eyes because my imagination or she thinks, if I don't see it, it, I'm going to be okay. But what happens ultimately is that I start filling in the blanks for myself, and I hear, I hear the score happening, I hear you know, the reactions in the room, and I'm like, holy crap, you know, if my parents are freaking out this much, it must be super scary. And inevitably, you create something in your mind that's uh, you, you know, potentially even worse than what's on screen, because the imagination um, is a pretty powerful thing. <laughs> that's true and and uh yeah that banister scene i thought was great i thought it was really it was amazingly shot I, it really does maximize the scare there um cool. and we we live in an era where uh like two-hour movies are pretty much the norm uh z is a very tight and laser focused story um was was this important to you um i think it's just uh when you're editing the film you know it's 
you the, the script was very tight. It had a million scenes in it, like an absurd amount of scenes. I think it was 185, which if you read scripts, usually you know a 90 page script ends up being in the 110 to 130 range. So it was very. I mean, it was tightly written to kind of go from scene to scene to scene to scene. And you know, in the final in the final uh, edit, it's missing like 30 or 40 scenes that we shot, and we just you know they just didn't make the cut because um, we're just you know strong proponents of just making sure that you're just keeping everything moving. You're not stopping for any reason. I mean, unless you need to do something super important, but you know, audiences are really smart and it's amazing what actors are able to do for the story of the film by, you know, you, you might think you need to learn something through a scene, but ultimately if the actor is able to be true to the script and to the character, they're able to put in these glimpses of things that you might be outright explaining in, in a scene, you know, later in the film that you realize that, everyone's already learned it because of, you know, what the performance is doing. And you find that the more you cut that down, um, the more that things like, say, Beth's father and what happened with him, um, you know, you're able to put those pieces together as an audience. And it's almost a little more rewarding if you feel like you're instinctual or you're instinctively picking up something that, you know, we're putting down. It makes you almost feel smarter where you go, like you're not being spoon fed everything. You're just able to sort of pick it up on your own. Like, oh, that's an interesting look that that person just gave them. There must be something between those two characters that's being unsaid. Because, you know, it's like actions speak louder than words. Um, it's trying to just capitalize on those. But I think, you know, especially in horror movies, they, they usually end up being around 85 to 90 minutes just because, you know, it's it's tough. A lot of these, you know, films, they're, they're based around smaller events with horror and stuff like that. You don't want to stretch it too thin and make it boring. So it's, it's definitely, you know, it's tricky. You're, you're cutting it. You just want to make sure that you're taking the audience for a ride and the ride doesn't ever get boring. So it's kind of balancing story and experience, um, you know, the whole way and hoping to find a, a good balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, my final question is, uh, what future projects are you working on? Um, I'm working on a script right now for another horror film. It's, it's a little different than the last two I've done. It's not, it's not something that would, uh, uh, it's not about a mom being scared to death by her kid. So it's definitely something, something different, but I do need to go back to that so I can finish my mama trauma trilogy. Um, but for now it's, I'm doing something more in the vein of like creep. I was actually supposed to be in production around now because, uh, but then everything got pushed because of the whole uh, COVID-19 thing. So right now everything's kind of on, on hold until we figure out when we can start shooting again. But uh, it's, it's something totally different from what I've done before. And I'm, I'm just excited to try something new and then, um, you know, maybe return to the demons and, and the supernatural horror things soon after. Cause it's always fun to, to sort of uh, use your you know imagination and the creativity to, to just try something kind of crazy. Uh, compared to, you know, what I'm trying to do right now, which is a lot more um, human-on-human craziness, I guess. And we're back. Uh, thank you once again to Brandon Christensen. Again, uh, Z, streaming on Shutter, starting on Mother's Day. If you haven't already, check it out. So um, this week, we wanted to talk uh, conspiracies, just because they're out there. Uh, we know you love them. Uh, who doesn't love them? We, we love a good conspiracy theory. So... Uh, we decided we'd delve into the rich history of movies that deal with conspiracies. So um, I'll start right off the bat with an easy question, I think. What do you guys think makes a good conspiracy theory movie? That's a good question because I guess it's a, it's a, it's a lot of things. Um, but I would say genuine, uh, a moment of genuine surprise it, it would always be appreciated in a good conspiracy movie. To where maybe, you know... You, as the audience member, you've been led astray just as much as the movie's trying to lead, you know, characters astray. That's always a good feeling. So yeah, like genuine mystery. Um, got to have strong characters. You got to have strong, believable. And then, so like, there are conspiracy movies that try to be conspiracy movies and they fucking fail. And then there's like the really strong ones um, that have like a really good thread. I guess. I guess is what I'm saying. It's like you got to have that good, solid payoff. And not just kind of maybe just some confusion, and then and then tr- tr- try to try to explain it at the end. That's no good to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a big exp- exposition dump at the end. I yeah. agree <laughs> with you about that. Um, the uh, I think what makes a good conspiracy movie is 
uh, it's really what makes a good conspiracy. It's one that's really out there, like way out there. Like you're like, okay, that makes sure. no sense whatsoever. That's really silly. That's stupid. But there's just that kernel of truth that makes you think that mm. uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, I think the best example of that would be like a 9-11 truther. Like that's, it's ridiculous to, to think that, you know, well, I don't mean to insult anybody, but um, I personally, <laughs> I'm not a 9-11 truther. However, I can see why someone may believe that if they weren't thinking. With... So you mentioned something, Blake. You kind of said offhand that sometimes they fail like spectacularly. What's a, what's an example of a what's an example of a failed conspiracy theory? Uh, I so unfortunately, uh, the the first movie that comes to mind recently is Us. I I feel like that movie, for all its good points. It really, by the the end, which is kind of just kind of what I was saying, it's kind of like this kind of info. Dump. Oh, like here it is. Here's this crazy fucking thing. I didn't like that. I didn't think the the beginning of the well, the whole two two thirds of the movie or three quarters it paid off to that end. You know what I mean? And then I, and then the end was such a reach that I was like, wow, that was that went from like really like something that was like fantastical and hard to believe, but cool. To being like, okay, well, this is just kind of off the rails. That's kind of what I'm saying. That's a very interesting choice. And, and you know, ultimately, Us, for me, um, failed. And it's funny that you say unfortunately because, yeah. I don't know, maybe you're in the same boat as me is that you really wanted to like it. Like oh, you I wanted, wanted it to. to be good. And there is some yeah. cool stuff about it. but uh, oh, There's a lot that it does well. Like, I, I think that that final shot, and I guess it's recent enough to where I won't get too much into spoilers, but right. they do do a really cool shot of, um, they basically kind of pan over the entire country. Mm-hmm. Super cool shot that pays back to something that's happening early in the movie, yeah. but um, the uh, everything that happens in between is kind of and, and plus they do kind of give away the twist in their trailers, so that kind of sucks. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I um, ultimately I, I agree with you. Actually, I, I didn't think of it as a conspiracy movie, but you're absolutely I agree with you that that's a movie that did in fact fail at what it was trying to do. Ultimately, um, what about you, Danny? What do you uh, think makes a good conspiracy movie? Uh, I don't know. I think there's a like a conspiracy. It's kind of a lot, a lot of like the little truths. Blake said it like I, really well, but I feel like if you could follow along, and there's always that like as they're as they give you a truth, they kind of give you a lie, and there's like a little bit of push, push and forth in that. I, it always it always gets my interest. Like um, we were talking about National Treasure before we started recording, but. The one that I think does really well, it's not really a movie. It got made into a movie, but Assassin's Creed, I know it's like anti-history, but it plays with a lot of uh-huh. conspiracy theories as well. Not anti-alternative uh, history. And I feel like it does really fucking cool little jobs. Cool. But uh, I feel it plays so well that at the end of it, I was like, well, that could possibly happen. You know, like the Templars versus the the, the Assassin's Creed, the Creed, I guess. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> the game. <laughs> I think they're just the assassins, aren't they? Yeah, I think. I, no, yeah. it's the Templars and the, so Knight, the they... Knights of Columbus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's this like thing that I really, I really like, and even like National Treasure plays with that kind of little ideas that you know, there's like secrets amongst amongst us everywhere, and it, that's the whole thing about conspiracy theories like there is some sort of like secret agenda of sorts you know what you mentioned a really interesting thing i want to get back to but you know where conspiracies kind of ultimately fail is that like if they're such these if they're so grand and awesome like how the hell does everybody know about them you mentioned alternate history danny i didn't even think about it but pretty much any single alternate history story it's built on a conspiracy like anything, like we just went through the plot against America, um, and they all seem to be about Nazis, right? Like the man in the high tower or whatever, sure. and sure. anything yeah, that yeah. involves, uh, yeah, World War Two having a different result is because of a conspiracy. It's um, either Jesus or Nazis. It's either fucking <laughs> Jesus conspiracies or Nazi. This or both. is true. This or is fucking true. both. Or, or it's, it's sometimes it's both because Hitler was into the occult. I think that's yeah, one of those. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's actually, I, you know, I always think it's either Civil War or World War II when it comes to alternate history. But you're right. Like, Jesus is in a lot of these conspiracies. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, it, yeah. It's this, like, whole da Vinci religious... Code. Yeah, the Da Vinci Code. Like, this whole... Yeah, there's there this whole like, religious upbringing in all, on these all. Like, you know, God was behind all of this. Uh, uh, I, I, again, another video game that does alternative history is, like, the Bioshock games. 
like played oh, with yeah. that kind of idea. You know, it's like this, at least with American culture, like we sell this whole dream about Americana and it kind of works. Like, you know, especially like in Bioshock Infinite, like you, you know, spreading the whole idea of the American dream to the rest of the world. It, it, right. it, there, there isn't, there's no lie there. It just you're like, yeah, that works, you, like, you know, like, right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's all about like having fun with like a crazy idea. Like, uh, two of my favorites, and like it's weird that I thought I don't know. I thought it was weird that I thought of these things um, coming up to this, but like uh, recently, I try to keep it current, I guess. But like recently, um, I would say John Wick, the whole John Wick series, how it's like there's this like oh, yeah. ass- assassins cabal that kind of runs the world. Like I kind of like I kind of fucking love that. Like I, I yeah. think that's a really really cool thing, um, uh, and like how they. It's like super fantastical. It's almost like there's like magic to in, involved in it in a way. Um, and then the other thing, there's a whole other side of like the to, of the conspiracy things that and then that uh, like is super pervasive. We just did the the alien documentary, uh, the X Files. Like the X Files is like to me like quintessential. If you're into conspiracy <laughs> nut job shit, like you gotta you definitely gotta watch the X Files. The yeah, was yeah. it the the was it the three guys that live in the basement that fucking that do yeah, the, the, uh, the the lone gunman the lone gunman yeah <laughs> the lone gunman. i was gonna call him the this i was like was it the three horsemen i was like no it's four horsemen <laughs> you're like the, 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 the three the, the three star wars fans you know yeah. you know those guys like us <laughs> <laughs> those guys that host the podcast you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. yeah it's it's funny with um conspiracy it's conspiracies you can only go in well it seems like they the majority of them do go in, in a couple of directions a government we've mentioned uh, history we've mentioned, but uh, religion also lots of conspiracy movies about religion. Um, I uh, I was trying and I did have some trouble thinking conspiracy theory movies, so I kind of stole Blake's favorite movie, um, Rosemary's Baby. Oh, that God. is a conspiracy theory movie, well, and really? it's the ultimate conspiracy. Hell yeah, you're trying to bring the devil back to earth. Oh shit! Fuck yeah! Okay, <laughs> that's just I didn't see it. Okay, that's I've never seen it brought that way, but I want you to. I want you to expand on that now because I'm fucking hooked. <laughs> Might be good now. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk a more. Talk about more about this cult. Would you Would you like me to go into the long version that that Blake thoroughly enjoys? <laughs> please, please do. Everybody else is like that movie. <laughs> long... uh, Rosemary and her husband are um, expecting a child, and she has these weird feelings. Like she, she just. Um, it's the movie touches on paranoia, really, is what it, it seems to be touching on, and to an extent, um, like not not loneliness, like preparedness. Basically, it's almost like she's not ready to to, to become a parent. Is it's kind of one of the vibes that I get out of it. But um, it turns out that she's right; that she's not paranoid; that there, in fact, is something wrong with her pregnancy. It's all been an elaborate plan by a group of Satanists. Um, dun, and she dun, in fact, uh... and she in fact does give birth to Devil Spawn. Um, if, I, <laughs> if I remember correctly, she does end up uh, loving the child, though. No, it doesn't end with her hugging and kissing the baby. Or uh, yeah, I haven't seen that movie. Because yet. she's in, she's gone to madness, though, right? It's like she's like, ha ha ha. Oh, I'm this, all, yes, I'm all cracked up now. Yes. <laughs> That's correct, because she. I think she. It's one of those things where, like, uh, is it Medusa? No, Medusa. You turn to stone. But there are yeah. a lot of creatures in in horror stories and mythology where you stare at them and you go mad. So yeah, I, I think you're right. She looks at the baby, and isn't there a cool shadow that they they show its claws like, or hooves or something? Or yeah, there's like there's like horns or yeah, there's there's some you know loose reference to it being like disfigured or or disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's it, it 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 ain't ten toes and ten ten feet. Eight pounds, ten ounces. There's a tail. He, uh, Turns it upside down, that. slaps it on the butt. <laughs> Bill Satan. Uh, it's uh no, that is the ultimate conspiracy. If you can conspire to get someone pregnant to bring uh, the Antichrist back to the earth. To me, that's one of the better, and maybe it's not the traditional conspiracy theory movie, but it certainly, you know, invokes lots of themes of religion in it. So that is uh, Blake's favorite conspiracy theory movie, and I'll, I'll see if I can come up with one right now. <laughs> so, uh, we we talked national treasure, but uh, and Blake, you talked about one that disappointed you. But what's what's an example of a good conspiracy theory movie? Uh, traditionally done, I would say, um, believe it or not. Um, 
And it comes up on a lot of lists if you like look at this stuff. But I, it's a movie I actually enjoy. Uh, it's Enemy of the State, I think, is what it's called. It's uh, Will Smith. Yes. Gene Hackman. I had it on my list. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely like kind of like I would say like um, pulpy in a way. It's like almost like pulp <laughs> conspiracy movie style uh, stuff. But uh, it's definitely like oh okay, there's like all these ties. I'm being watched. You know, you can't trust anybody. Uh, they're gonna kill you. They're gonna kill somebody before you can get to them. That kind of stuff. And yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was a well done movie. There's, like I said, there's there's lots of these things out there that I that I think that I'm like, man. In in all actuality, yeah, they are kind of conspiracy. But traditional, that's like a that's more of a. I was gonna say modern. What was that probably 1999 or 98 or something? But yeah, I would say anyway. yeah, it's modern enough. I you know I was thinking traditionally. And I'll, I'll base my own, I'll stick with government, but mine in true life, um, all the president's men they are a real comp- conspiracy. Yeah. Watergate, a very yeah, serious yeah. thing. Yeah, and, JFK, uh, yeah. That's a great. That's yeah, a great good old movie. JFK, <laughs> and it, it led to the presidency of uh, Taft, right? But, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's right. <laughs> it, it was either Taft or, or, or Jefferson. I forget who came after Kennedy. Oh. But um, the um, <laughs> now, all the president's men. <laughs> <laughs> it was LBJ. Yeah, LBJ, Lyndon, Lyndon Blaine Jefferson. Yeah. <laughs> Lady Bird. LeBron Jefferson. Lady Bird. <laughs> but, oh. oh, man, that was an easy LeBron James joke there. <laughs> yes. That was a I layup. I dropped the ball. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> no, All the President's Men is great based on Water Watergate. And I'm sure at the time it was probably – uber interesting to, to watch yeah. that like i watch it you know decades after all of that and i mean the story I'm, I'm old enough to where you know richard nixon was still at, well he was still alive actually when i saw it but <laughs> um that was a, a bit, that's a very good movie with some strong actors and i mean robert redford's in it and uh it's good stuff it's good stuff and what, what about you danny what's your favorite conspiracy theory movie you can't say national treasure again no, no, no. I was, I, I had actually have like a good little list. All right, so I just want to say, I think oh. my dad, I think my dad was a, a, a conspiracy theorist at one point or another. I, so I had obviously I put National Treasure on there. I had any any of the state, but there has like a younger sister movie that came out like a couple of years back with uh, Sandra Bullock, and it's called The Net. Oh, The Net! I was like, oh, the, the, net. Yeah. the Net. Yeah, I the thought you were talking about like, geniality. Dude, that was golden era, Sandra Bullock. That was that was yeah, the gold era. That is like it, it was on in Spanish the other day, so I just I decided to watch the whole thing, and then Dennis Miller's character came up, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm not, I can't deal with his voice. But um... <laughs> so Mexican Spanish Dennis Miller was just as annoying as regular. Dennis Miller. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was really bad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> does does, uh, does Mexican Dennis Miller call football games? You know, this is like I think uh, computers are like becoming like this. Even those hackers came out before it, but I feel like computers were like um, just starting to be in households, and hacking was like a little thing that everybody was trying to get into. Oh, the internet! And, yeah, we knew what the internet was. Then. Yeah, so like you know, why not play with the most scariest thing at the time? Yeah. And it just fucks up with everything. And I think, just like what Enemy of the State did, it's just this thing that just shreds enough a little bit of truth where a big brother could like pay attention to you and just fuck with everything. And uh, I still think about how, like, scary it is. Like, but, I mean, it obviously still happens, but how scary, like, one, yeah. like, thing, you, like, somebody does, it just screws up somebody else's life. And now they're at Mac World trying to <laughs> <laughs> redeem themselves. What a movie this was, man. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking. 1995, man. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah. I thought it was oh, way, way earlier. I thought it was a, it came out like in 92, 93. Man, that was way off. I love it's that like it's described as... Yeah, yeah, and it's described as a cyber action thriller. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. Oh, <laughs> <excuse me>. oh. <laughs> conspiracy theory movies. I mean, any, any conspiracy movie. Uh, uh, essentially, it's just a fan theory on a grander scale. So um, with the birth of the... Well, fan theories have always been around, but with the birth of the internet, we have more access to them. So uh, what's your favorite fan theory about a movie? Oh, definitely the ghost in fucking Three Men and a Baby. <laughs> oh, that one's good. Yeah. That one's def- also, I, I'm a, I'm partial to the Hanging Munchkin. In oh, the, the Hanging box. Munchkin's really good. I, that that actually looks way creepier than the than the Ted Danson cardboard cutout. <laughs> 
was. Yeah, the cardboard cut out. When I was a kid, the cardboard cut out was uh, pretty. No, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty creepy though when you when you watch it and you're like, okay, there's supposed to be a ghost in this scene, and then you look at it, you're like, oh fuck, yeah, there is. You know, um, <laughs> uh, another. I have a couple of favorites, but uh, the Stanley Kubrick moon landing thing for. Uh, so I have the moon landing on my list here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys believe so, in the moon landing? Do you guys believe in it? You know, let's let's let let's uh, let's table that for a while. Oh. We're gonna get back to it. No, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna get to it. We're, we're definitely right. gonna cover it because I, I, I. All right. So my favorite, I'm obviously, my, my, my favorite, my, my favorite cons- or fan theory is the Save by the Bell one, where um, only the first episode is actually true, or the first season, excuse me, is true. Everything afterward is Zach Morris's dream. I absolutely love that theory. That that's why there's no. Um, they don't the episodes don't connect that's the things happen one episode that are super important and they never ever are are referred to or mentioned again they have no lasting impact so that's why you have stuff like you know ac slater learning that his last name is really sanchez and it's never <laughs> ever brought up again um even the opening credits are like dream bubbles um, and this is why Zach can stop time. And, time out, yeah. and in the first season, he's he's a loser. He's like he's like Screech. He just has better hair. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he's living and he lives in Indiana in the first season. After that, yeah. he's living you know on the beach in the best school in California. And he's super popular. He gets the girls, any girl, every girl that he wants, he gets. Yeah. Oh, um, I absolutely love the idea that Saved by the Bell. Is um is a dream, especially considering that in the reboot he's going to be the governor of California. Right. This is right. so this amazing. Into it, yeah. This is well. It's honestly, it's like Dallas. It's like the series Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Danny? What's your What's your favorite fan theory? So my favorite. There has been a lot, like Jar Jar Binks being like the actual Sith leader. Uh, That's the one I was hoping you would say. Yeah, but my fi- like I think the one that I'd like to really talk about is Rugrats. That uh, oh, Tommy's yeah the suicide yeah, right the suicide yeah yeah it's all like it's still like Tommy's a stillborn so Angelica is like thinking like is imagining all, all of this. I-, I think it's a fucking crazy ass fan theory. I I just feel like when they're talking about this they're tr- like especially like a fucking kids cartoon like they're trying to make it as dark and like surreal and give it some sort of meaning and i just i I think that's one of my favorite ones that that this three-year-old is imagining her would have been fucking baby cousin still being alive and her parents are you know just terrible parents that are not paying attention so she imagines a baby but (laughs) that that one's crazy no, that that one's that one's pretty awesome. Have you heard the one? Um, which uh, what's the? Uh, da, 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 it was in the. It's the television show, um, not Hill Street Blues, Saint Elsewhere, where it ends with the yeah. boy who has. Uh, have you heard the theory about that one? Because that no. that one. Uh, so essentially, Saint Elsewhere ends. Um, it's alluded to that the whole show may have been. It's- the imagination of a boy with autism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly. They never outright say that, but it's very strongly alluded to that that's what mm-hmm. happened. Um, oh. St. Elsewhere had a crossover with Cheers. Uh, Cheers has quite a number of spinoffs, Frasier being the most popular. Um, and you can connect these shows. Cheers has also done crossovers with Wings. Uh, Wings has characters in other shows, but... Um, on the internet, and I, I read something about the theory. Uh, this is recently when I was watching Cheers, but people have been able to connect 85% of all television shows ever to this one boy's imagination. So, <laughs> like, it's so basically, I, I think his name is Tommy, I think it is, but all these shows are just a figment of his imagination, basically, which is a pretty like awesome. Bobby's world. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like Bobby's world, <laughs> except it's Tommy's world in a snow globe. So, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Blake kind of touched on this. Oh. So, uh, conspiracy theories. There's a lot of them. We we've touched on. I think we've just tip of the iceberg. Who knows? Because we we know so much about it, we might yeah. even be a part of some sort of conspiracy. So, yeah. um, which of these? I definitely am. By the way. <laughs> Oh, so there it is. Which of these conspiracies do you guys believe? And we will start with the moon landing. Blake, yes. you had some questions about the moon landing. What what questions did you have for us? Yes, I mean, are you total fucking crackpots and believe that we didn't land on the moon? <laughs> okay, so first of all, a uh, loaded question. 
<laughs> I am a crackpot, but <laughs> but <laughs> no, I I think I think we landed on the moon. Like I I, I honestly I, I hear stories from our parents and like I just had to hear Sting sing about it. Then I knew. <laughs> Yeah, Sting has a really good song, and Michael Jackson obviously fucking moonwalk. So duh. <laughs> yeah, must be two perfectly you know, good uh, examples. <laughs> of the eight, I, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll try to. I'll try to be a, a good person and not take any sides in regards to whether I believe it or not. But I will say this: if I were to fake a moon landing, if I had the power to pick a director to do it. It would, in fact, be Stanley Kubrick in what 1969? I guess that was. Yeah, it's all earlier. Yeah. 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 Was it earlier? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'm a true American. I don't even know when we landed on the moon. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> um, no, all I know I, is uh, 1775 is when America was born, baby. 1776, but close. Damn, close. So off. So off. <laughs> yeah, in, in 1775, Columbus sold the ocean green. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I think we landed on the moon. The real question is, did we land on it when we said we landed on it? That dun dun dun. <laughs> That's where it comes from. <laughs> We've definitely been on the moon, but when did we get there? Have you ever and heard did we beat the, the Russians? Well, right. And have you ever heard the uh, the whole the whole thing about the guy who stole the moon rocks? That's a cool conspiracy story unto itself. There's like this fucking guy who like. He basically just wanted like bang chicks and like steal moon rocks and sell them. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a steal moon, pretty. Where, cool where was he stealing these moon rocks from? From NASA. From NASA, yeah. Yep. I, yeah. I heard that. Oh, where yes. did I hear that? I only vaguely remember it, but it's it's a it's a pretty incredible story. Yeah. So this guy, uh, I, and I know you guys don't remember it exactly. So essentially, this dude was stealing moon rocks from NASA, and I guess showing them off to girls he met at bars or something, and being like trying to hook up with them. Yep, oh, uh, I, I admire. I admire that. I that's very creative. <laughs> so you can go to FBI.gov in the archives, and it's called the case of stolen moon rocks, and it they have a whole thing about it. Now, um, so this is Thank this you. is verified. This Thank is you, true? FBI. Well, yeah, no, this FBI. is this is a, this is a guy who actually, yeah, he actually he actually did did this whole thing. Yep. So my th- my thing about this is, um, since this did happen, uh, he still must have incredible game. To be able to get laid just because he has moon rocks, because you have to convince a person that th- these, you know, rocks are actually from the moon. So uh, this guy was getting laid no matter what. I say. I mean, yeah. congrats. I mean, in my <laughs> head, it's just, it's literally just Don Johnson. In my head, it's Nicolas Cage. Oh, 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 man! I was leaning towards Stanley Kubrick. He's getting rocks <laughs> off the set. <laughs> are there any conspiracy theories out there that you guys? Do believe a uh, moon landing aside? Uh, do Ooh. believe chemtrails? Or, or the... I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh. go with chemtrails. <laughs> I'm gonna Which just one? uh yeah. So you know you know what chemtrails are? So you know like when you look over in the sky and there's like obviously airplanes flying above oh, you that yeah, leave yeah, yeah, yeah. on trails of uh, water vapor that comes off their wings and engines and such. Um, so there's a there's a vast majority of people, not majority. There's a lot of people out there. That believe that um, there are planes, not maybe not all of them, but there are planes up there that are spraying down um, things like urine. lithium, lithium <laughs> urine. Yeah, that's just Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> uh, that's what they do. Um, but no, they, they it's like mind control, or they're like, oh, it's going to subdue. Or the other one, there's two sides of it. It's like, oh, it's mind control, or it is weather mani- uh, manipulation so um which actually they do they do do that kind of thing so that's why i'm like i'm yeah that's the one i believe so we're gonna go with that call me a, call me a crackpot god damn it i cut you <laughs> well, that's all right we got our tinfoil hats on so it's cool they can call you whatever you want you can't it's not getting through that hat well god damn right um i'm i'm sure. kind of like, like i'm, I'm kind of gonna go with the fox molder out here i i, I want to believe like all this, all this UFO stuff, all the you know Roswell and Area Fifty One, and uh, you know, fun. This is kind of funny. After we watched Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, the Blink One Eighty Two guy, he released footage. Uh, the the government declassified footage of. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, another thing we've done this year. I mean, there's a conspiracy <laughs> for everyone out there. How the hell have we been on the cusp of all the news this year? It's crazy. <laughs> 
um, persistent. I, I, you heard I it would here like, first. You, you no, you really did hear it. <laughs> um, I I would love to believe that uh, that, that UFOs aliens are real. I mean, I hope. Oh, you that... know, I got. I'm gonna change mine. Chupacabra. I want Chupacabra to be real. That's well, you know, I was gonna go with the. Uh, I was gonna oh. go with the uh, the Mothman. Oh, Mothman's a good one. Mothman's a good yeah. one. Jersey really... Devil. Any of the crypto zoological. Yeah, those are yeah, really cool. I'm on board with. Even Bigfoot. Like Bigfoot's my least favorite because I'm like, nah. But. <laughs> No, he's not real. <laughs> uh, not that one. <laughs> well, but Mothman, you know, like, yeah. Mothman's cool, and uh, I would I, see. I wouldn't be so down with the New Jersey Devil because he hurts people. Oh, does and he? I don't. Isn't he the one who? Or maybe I'm thinking of New Jersey Devils fans. <laughs> I think they get drunk. <laughs> they get drunk. You're just thinking of Mark Messier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of Mark Messier exactly. <laughs> I, I thought, well, you know, it's the name. It's really, well, you, there's a documentary. I believe it's uh, it came out before the Blair Witch Project. I th- I want to say it's called The Last Broadcast. Oh yeah, it, it's a, yeah, Last Broadcast. I think they're hunting for the New Jersey Devil, and it ends with uh, it ends with them. I mean, it's a type of thing, but I believe the New Jersey Devil kills them is the implication of it. But um, okay, well, if he doesn't hurt people, or it, 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 collapse the whole bridge. Yeah, yeah, but that was in self defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they Jamie. put up that giant light bulb. <laughs> that, that's that's a tease. They're teasing the poor guy. Guys, you're missing the whole the whole thing here. David Copperfield made a whole fucking like set the Statue of Liberty disappear. Where is his conspiracy? <laughs> well, that, there's a book about it. I think <laughs> that there is right. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, written by Chris Angel. He will tell you exactly how he made that work. <laughs> I would uh like when I was a kid I well, like I think every kid I go through a phase where they like the Bermuda Triangle and UFOs and uh, the Abominable Snowman and stuff like that like Bigfoot I would be totally cool with because one it's uh pretty much like a hundred percent an American thing so I, I have a better chance of seeing him even though I don't think he really comes down to the oh, Southwest man. very often. Yeti, there's Yeti. Yeah, Yeti, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Yeti. Like, yeah, oh yeah, and that the one. Wind- it would be and a Wendigo. Wendigo is like almost oh, that's a uh, Native American. Yeah, and that's like more of almost like a shape shifting person. Yeah, right? it's like yeah, that one's like supernatural in its. Yeah. Whereas it's not as We're logical as the moth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one time I was oh, listening and- to Coast, Coast AM, and this lady called in. She's like, "I I get why uh, nobody sees Bigfoot." And George Nori was like, "Oh, really? Why?" And she was like, "Well, it's simple. He's an interdimensional species that face shifts in between our reality and others." Are you, that is that is crazy that you say that. There there's a there's a, a series. Uh, Seth Breedlove is the name of the producer, but he does this series called Small Town Monsters, and each season is basically he goes after like tries to um, uncover an, a, a myth basically. Uh, and Bigfoot was the first season, and most of it is you know cryptozoologists and they and they kind of delve into the history of Bigfoot and stuff like that. But there is a – because there's all kinds of big, Bigfoot hunting societies across the country, and there are people who genuinely believe that he is – he travels through portals, and that's how you can see him in the Pacific Northwest, or you can see him in Ohio, or yeah. you can see him in Florida. That is – that's yeah. funny that you – I've never heard anybody say that aside from that documentary. <laughs> that's so funny. That's the thing, dude. It's always – that was years ago when I heard this lady call it, so it's always stuck in my mind. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, wow, this lady called in about a crazy thing and got crazier with it. Holy fucking shit. Good for her. She somehow made it more interesting. <laughs> yeah. I kind of touched on the Bermuda Triangle there. How, did they, like, did, well, one, did you there. guys believe in that one? You're, you've been, you, have you really been through it? Yeah, I've been in the Bermuda Triangle, man. I made it out. Anything crazy happen? <laughs> well, I'm, obviously you made it out. <laughs> Uh no no nothing nothing crazy happened it, but it, while I was there I I totally uh like inundated myself with uh Bermuda Triangle nonsense to to scare myself and it was pretty great that that one's interesting I mean there is lots of um yeah. missing planes and and vessels and stuff like that um however I think if you took any you know thirty thousand square mile patch of ocean <laughs> they, you would have similar results as far as bad stuff happening so um it's it's just a high traffic area you know what i mean so it's kind of some of that stuff's explainable but you know whole squadrons of of airplanes going missing and there's definitely some interesting yeah. stuff to yeah. it yeah flight 19 I, yeah yep. also atlantis is another one that i i also like Ooh, atlantis 
You know, like and minus is a good one. That's a really you know good what? that is a very good one. Uh, we're little, totally yeah. actually. There's a bunch of ancient ones. Good call, Danny. There's a bunch of ancient <laughs> ones. We need to have a whole other show about ancient ones. Yeah, that's a, that, that. Like, there's like so many things. Like you, you brought up the chupacabra and everything, and I was like, but we I, we have like the whole crypto zoology zoology on this. But I, I feel like there's so many things that like when we talk about conspiracy theories, there's literally anything. Like, <laughs> oh, trust me. You could turn anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I think it's true. so great. I, I feel like there's a conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories, and yeah. I think that was like that was gonna be my deal. But I was like, no, that's kind of like a cop out. But it's just so Every interesting. That- conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories is that they they use conspiracy certain conspiracy theories to misdirect you about actual conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See that that's a great. That's point. Alex Jones did. That's a false flag <laughs> operation. Like, give me a break. Get out of here. You know which, you know which conspiracy theories are the best are when uh, you kind of bring it up to someone like uh, whatever. Have you ever heard of the Bermuda Triangle? And then the person's like, uh, "Yeah, I'd rather not talk about that," even <laughs> though they <laughs> like they've never like like you've actually been there, right? Like they've never they've never been to Florida even. But you yeah. know, they're so scared of the, the actual conspiracy and bringing some kind of curse down on them that they don't even want to discuss it. Um, I don't. I'm surprised we never talked the Illuminati either. That seems to be a more uh, modern one. You know, yeah. So the Bohemian Grove is is another one. And so, like, I I actually I do have this. Uh, and I real quick. So I actually have a newsletter um, from Bohemian Grove. Can you believe that shit? I've never heard of that. What what is that? Well, Bohemian Grove is it's one of the it's along the Illuminati lines. It's uh, what you would call like an elitist, um, ultra rich um social group um and they meet in northern california and uh in a place that's a big private ranch and they call it bohemian grove and really it is a bunch of rich people and influential uh politicians and most it's mostly it's a fucking rich person's club right right so and, it's super similar to the illuminati yeah and uh, the whole yeah. theory is is they go meet there like once or twice a year um, and obviously, lots of back dealings, lots of the actual the way the world works happens in these meetings. That stuff, um, and so gotcha. I, yeah. And so the the funny thing is, <clears throat> it is that it is a super elite uh, club, a private club that you have to be invited to. Uh, my uncle, uh, it happens to be uh, a very well connected uh, art historian, and so right. uh, in San Francisco, already in the area. Wait, 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 wait. Can we discuss this further without <laughs> disappearing? Uh, you know what? <laughs> I think we'll be okay. But yeah, it's just okay. a bunch of people hanging out in the woods and and getting getting wasted on champagne and and martinis and uh, yeah, I, I think there's. But the funny thing is, I definitely do think there is an air of like, yeah, lots of shit happens there that you know, lots of decisions get made there. Is it like some evil weird cabal of like sex freaks and stuff? No, they like eat like finger sandwiches and drink wine. <laughs> That's, like, that's so like <laughs> you know what's funny uh you're talking about like you know the, the super elite and one of the things that people love to theorize about is about the ultra rich because we have no idea what like you know the uber rich like we have no idea what that is like um a very popular conspiracy theory and we most recently saw it in ready or not well i guess the hunt also came out is that mm-hmm. the rich are going after people in lower um, class statuses and, and class structures. Uh, the rich literally feed off the poor in some cases, which uh, I think is a super interesting conspiracy theory. Um, I've never heard of Bohemian Grove. Uh, I'm imagining they wrote Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody, but uh, that's <laughs> that's really interesting. Anything involving I'm I'm always so interested in, in the class structure more than any other divide, and there's so many of them in this country. I think the class divide is like the biggest problem that we have, but it's also the most interesting one to look into without getting too serious um, <laughs> and disappearing <laughs> and disappearing all of a sudden because i am not in a high class bracket at all um Neither i'm way. also surprised that we didn't get more into the bible because those are some of the biggest nuts of all i know some otherwise <laughs> super intelligent people who actually believe in God. Every Saturday you can find us here. Um, the rest of the week you can go to adventuresinportaste.com where you can find all our podcasts. We have uh, Talking Tauntauns who will talk about the Star Wars stuff that we missed, uh, Poor Taste Wrestling, and the General Comics podcast. Uh, you can also catch up with all our reviews and leave your thoughts. Uh, Maya Thornton, she's one of the newer movie contributors. She wrote a super interesting article 
about the first film adaptation of Beauty and the Beast and the themes of uh, domination and uh, the queer um, sensibilities it has to it. But uh, check it out. And while you're checking that out, uh, follow us on Adventure. You can follow Adventures in Movies on Twitter over at AAPT Movies, or you can follow us individually. You can find Nathaniel or Pat, as I like to call him, on Instagram at Nathan Port Taste. You can find me, Danny, on Twitter and Instagram at default underscore player. You can find Blake the Moonlander on Twitter at 4 Eyed Horror. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, next week, we are going to be doing, uh, I'm going to call them one room features. So, kind of. Uh, those those films and features where you they're all compartmentalized and small and packed in should be interesting. And uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Spotify. Uh, you can give us uh, Stitcher a, a shot. But uh, you can go to YouTube where you can now find Adventures in Movies. Also, we have Adventures in Movies looks at. Uh, this week we're going to look at Driveways. It's uh, one of Brian Dennehy's last performances before his uh, unfortunate passing. Uh, make sure to give us a rating. Or just tell a friend. And that's our cue. We'll talk to you next week. I want to believe. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah.